like to introduce Tom McNulty from Regatu. He, I've talked to him for a few minutes, and I get the sense that he's kind of like the Scott McLaren of x-rays. <laughs> he wants to analyze everything, so you're going to see some really cool x-ray analysis here. Uh, he has a lot of experience in the field. He's been working for 35 years on x-ray analysis, and this is going to be a really exciting talk about the different uh, soft material, low Z material, non-traditional material analysis that you can do with x-rays without having to go through the synchrotron. Okay, well thank you very much. That's quite the introduction. Um, normally I would like a great introduction like that, except when I'm following Scott, also known as the Beatles, <laughs> showing essentially subatomic resolution chemical bonds being formed. This is going to be something a little different, in fact, uh, very different than a lot of things we talked about this morning. Because th this technique, uh, although it is lower resolution, is a volume technique. So there's not a surface technique. This is something that allows us to actually look inside materials, and in most cases, with zero sample prep. So just quickly, how many people out there have ever you know, had any experience you know, with tomography for, for material science? Anyone ever done it before? OK, so there's a few. What about people, anybody in the audience actually had a CAT scan on, on themselves, right? Okay, so you'll, you'll recognize some, some similarities here. The, the basic idea with, with tomography is that it's an x-ray absorption technique, and it varies from traditional x-ray radiography in the sense that it's able to look at the volume rather than just simply a projection of the volume. Chances are, if you had a, you know, a tomogram done at the doctor's office, you know, for, for example, if you've ever had a, a, a chest x-ray, they'll stand you this way, and then they'll also stand you this way, right, so they can get both directions, because they want to make sure that something you may have right, is not hiding behind a rib bone or something like that. So the problem with normal radiography is that everything projects up to one surface. So what tomography does is through a relatively simple experiment, grant you the reconstruction to get the actual image is, is not simple by any means. But the measurement is pretty simple, right? So <clears throat> before I start on that, I want to show you this picture because this is quite interesting. So this is the first CT system that Regat whoever made. And it was made under contract with, I believe it was the, the government. They wanted to determine the age of this tree that you see here, which by the way is a soft matter material. Okay. Um, but it was in the middle of a forest. So they needed to build the CT system around the tree. Right? And for those of you who are, are you know, true experimentalists, you might get a big kick by looking at some of the very high precision things that are required to make this work, like cinder blocks <laughs> right? and normal pulleys. But essentially what you do have here is you have every component that you need for a CT is you have an x-ray source here, right? You have a detector here. And essentially the way this experiment works is that the x-ray beam is shot through the sample. Of course, it's absorbed as it goes through the sample. So we see an attenuation, right, of the x-ray beam in different directions. We then rotate the sample or rotate the beam. In this case, we'd be rotating the beam. It would be difficult to rotate the tree, right? But the idea is that we shoot in all those different directions. <clears throat> We can then math math mathematically calculate the density distribution that would have given rise to the attenuation in all of those different directions. And I'll, I will say that that is a very, very simplistic explanation of the mathematics that actually goes on there. Some of these calculations can still today take 10 hours, right, on a, for example, the PC that we have in our laboratory specifically to do this is a $35,000 PC. So it's, I'm not an IT guy, but it's loaded with all the things, with all the bells and whistles. And it can still take up to 10 to 12 hours to actually make the calculation to do this reconstruction. So, so the measurement's easy, reconstruction not so easy. But let's just look basically at how this works in general. And then we'll get into the modifications that we make to a traditional CT system to look at some of this soft matter material. So this is the basic CT geometry. We start with an x-ray source. And this is uh, the whole idea is that this source needs to be very, very small. These are typically on the order of about 5 microns, maybe 10 microns. Because the size is so small, they're very low power. The size of this source ultimately is the resolution right, of what this machine will see. That beam will diverge through the sample and project onto a detector. 
uh, there are a variety of different types of detectors that people use depending on the application. But what we see here is that the magnification that we get, the ability to look at the small features of the sample here projected on the detector, comes from the magnification that we see the divergence of the x-rays. That's the basic principle of CT. It's actually pretty simple. And then we do that in all different directions. And then we go through that reconstruction that I talked about to, to get the overall uh, density distribution. When we do it this way, we have to have resolution at the detector, which essentially matches up right, to the sample size and the pixelation of what we'd expect to see coming out of the source. OK, so this is the basic CT geometry. It, it suffers from, from, from a few inherent problems, one of which is the source needs to be very, very small right, in order to have the resolution. If the source was larger, the resolution would be, would be worse. But because the, the source is so small, we really can't load it with a lot of x-ray power. Right, so what happens, if you're, if you're familiar with how you generate x-rays, you take an electron beam, you shoot that out of metal. Essentially, that metal then will fluoresce x-rays. But it also, there's a lot of heat generated. And if you, if you, make, if you put too much power onto that small spot, you, just, you, you melt the source. So what we've developed at Ragaku right, is what we call a quasi-parallel beam CT geometry. Okay? And one of the things it allows, just starting from, the, from this side here on the source, it allows us to use a much larger source. And the reason for that is the resolution is actually not coming from this X-ray source. It's coming from the scintillation effect that happens at the scintillator here, which is a YAG scintillator. But the idea also is that because this source now can be larger, we can move the sample further away from the source because we're not going to be looking for the magnification from the x-ray. So being that we don't need that, we can move the sample further away from the source. And because of that, and the larger size, we can get a larger field of view than we would typically see on a, a, a traditional CT. So that's one of the advances, is that because the source is, is much larger, we can put a lot more power into it. Are, 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 is anybody in, in the room here familiar with uh, rotating out x-ray generators? All right. Uh, OK, there's one. Got to raise the hand real hot. <laughs> so the idea of a rotating anode is that piece of metal that we smash the electrons into rotates. And because it rotates, as it's rotating, it's cooling itself. Right? So we can put a lot more power into it. And the idea is that we can put 1,200 watts into this 70 micron source. Right? That's a lot different than the 5 to 10 that you put into the 5 micron source. Okay? What happens then? is the scintillator scintillates. And the scintillator has a point spread function of about a micron at this point. So that ultimately becomes the resolution of the machine. There are things that we can do. What, exactly what the resolution is for a particular source size is a little bit complex. It is possible to get slightly better resolution right, than the, the uh, scintillating spot itself. And that's really because if we measure that point spread function as a full width half max, it turns that we don't need to go all the way to the full width half max to see some difference in signal. So we can actually extend it a little further than the full width half max of the scintillator. But after the scintillator now, now we're dealing with visible light, about 555 nanometers at this point. And we have an objective lens and then a camera lens, which is coupled to the CCD. This CCD has 5.4 micron resolution at the detector. And that allows us then, from here to here to here, to essentially, on this microscope, see about 500 nanometer right, resolution that we can see. Now, 500 nanometer resolution is actually the interesting question that I have here for you guys. Because where we're seeing a lot of interest in this is in what I would call materials engineering, right, as opposed to material science. When I look at the types of things that people were looking at earlier in the day today, the features that you can see right, with, with, with an SEM, TEM, AFM, they're much, much smaller right, than the features that you would see with, with a, uh, a tomography system. The features that we see are kind of the, what we'll call engineered material features. Right? The people who are interested in this type of technology, you have some polymer people that are looking at, at, at large domains in polymers. You have people who are working with carbon fibers, for example, who want to look at how those fibers right, are inlaid right, into a binder. So this is not at the molecular level, certainly not at the atomic level. But it is at what we'll call the, the more macroscopic 
morphological level in terms of things that you can, can see with it. Okay? So when we use this quasi-parallel beam geometry system, we have a couple of things here now that we can do that make it ideal for looking at uh, some soft materials. Right? I only have 20 minutes, so I'm going to go through some of the slides pretty quick. This is an actual photo of the inside of the machine. Here's the X-ray source. Here's the X-ray uh, detector, which here you're looking at the one lens, the scintillator. Then there's a lens in here. The, uh, the camera lens is here, and the CCD is sitting off on the, on the wall here. Here's the sample in this case, and this sample sits on a phi axis that rotates the sample 360 degrees. That's how we get the different, uh, that's how we rotate the tree, right, in, in fact. This is a close-up look of the scintillator. Here's a close-up look. You can't see it so well. This is the back end of the objective lens. OK, um, just quickly on this one, for those of you who have seen a rotating atom before, here you have, this is the Regahu Micromax 007 rotating atom, which is the X-ray source for this. This, as I said, can pump 1,200 watts uh, into a 70 micron spot. Um, we can also change the anodes. Right? What we see here is a, a mechanical device that allows us to actually reposition the anode. Let's see. What? Where is it? Here we go. Allows us to reposition the anode such that we can have two stripes of metal on the anode. And depending on where the X-ray beam hits, we can get two different wavelengths. So the idea is when we look at soft materials, we're going to be very, very interested in making sure that the wavelength of the X-ray is very well tuned, right, essentially to the Z level or the, the electron density of that particular material. So in this shot here, there's the rotating anode. And essentially, here's the shutter mechanism at the top. Right, the X-ray beam would be coming out there. This is what the machine looks like. It's about the size of a double-wide refrigerator. Right, here we have the doors open. And then here's where we're looking at close up at this section, this section. OK, now, so here are some of the advantages right, if we deal with the high-powered monochromatic parallel beam geometry. And this is what we're talking about. High-powered, I mentioned already, we've got the 1,200 watts. The fact is, when we look at a traditional CT, the CT uses what we call white radiation. Most of the CT systems out there use a tungsten source. And what we're doing there is we're looking at the white radiation or the bremsstrahlung from that tungsten source, not the characteristic tungsten. So there's a broad spectrum of wavelengths right, in the machine. Here, with being that we're using this particular type of generator, we're doing a either, we have a choice of three wavelengths. We can use copper, we can use chromium, or we can use molybdenum. And these are just the three wavelengths that we have at pretty routine um, uh, anodes for our crystallography systems. And it's the fact that those are all relatively low energy, right, relatively long wavelength, that we realize that this machine, using our conventional core technology, would be very appropriate for uh, soft matter for, for light materials. Okay? But when we think about it, this geometry offices intensity, of course, we talked about. Okay? We're going to get slightly better resolution by using that source with the scintillator. The contrast we're going to get, we'll talk about that in a minute, it, that actually comes from using the different wavelengths. We can tune the wavelength to, to, to uh, uh, best maximize contrast. And we also mentioned a little bit of the field of view. Now, assuming that we are work, working with the right materials, for those of you who are microscopists, and I know a lot of you are, if you look at the four most important things of microscopy, <laughs> They're pretty much right there. And these are the actual advantages that this, that this uh, geometry brings if the material is, is, is appropriate, which is why we're talking about the soft matter materials. OK, let's just talk quickly about resolution. Um, so what a, resolution is, is, a, is, a, is kind of a term that a lot of people go back and forth about in terms of what, what, what creates resolution. And without going into the details, um, a, a great question that someone might ask, well, you just said that you had a, a 70 micron source and then your, your, your point spread function for the scintillator is a, mic a micron. So how are you going to get to 0.6 micron resolution? And I said that that would be just another little 
15, 20 minute workshop, so I, I won't go into that. But the point is that we can get there, and the way that we do that is to measure fiducial image. So here what you're seeing, right, is a fiducial image of a 0.6 uh, micron uh, spacing here, or 600 nanometers. So that's what we're able to get. Here's actually the full device here, as I said. So here's the scintillator, then you've got the objective lens, there's the camera lens inside here, and then here's the uh, CCD detector. Okay, and what does resolution do for us? Well, in terms of the, in terms of the microscopy world here, is this is a, uh, we've, we've actually, this is not a conventional system versus ours. We've kind of tweaked ours to, to make it look bad, just so for the, for the slide. But from here to here, right, is an improvement of resolution, right? We're able to see smaller features which make things, you know, look clearer. But really what we still have is we have something else that we can do between these, right? And the other is to look at essentially contrast, right? So here we have, this is a foam sample, uh, very similar to the foam that you would have if we had pads on the armrests, right? For example, in the, in the chairs here. And you can see how the images change based on the different radiation that we use. The lighter the material is gonna be, the better we're gonna do with chromium. If we have a very light material, for example, then that may have some, some transition metals in it or something like that, so that the overall density is kind of in between, we would choose the copper. And we do need penetration power on a material that may be, for example, a small piece of metal, then we go to the molly. But the idea is that you can see between the three here, these are constant resolution. We, we, we can get better and better images, in this case, as we go to the uh, longer wavelength. So if we put contrast and resolution together, so here we started with our uh, low resolution, went to the higher resolution, now we've added the contrast, that's what we're looking for, right? So that's the key, right, of, of the type of image that we can, can get. And uh, that is, by the way, uh, an ant lake. And one of the features that you don't see until you get to the highest level of contrast and resolution are these little hairs. They're about a micron in diameter that come off, off the ant lake. We're gonna see more of the, the ant lake here in a bit. So I, I, I mentioned this at the first slide. As we move the sample further away from the source, which we can do if we don't need the magnification factor, and then we put the sample here, we can just simply see that we get a larger field of view for the same geometry than we would in the, in the projection. And that is one of the limitations of CT in terms of what the, the field of view can be. To look at something 500 nanometers, you're, all, you're looking at a field of view which is you know, maybe 0.7 by 0.7 millimeters, right, so it's small. We do talk about tomography as being non-destructive. That's unless you need to destroy the sample to get it in the sample, but, I mean, to get it in the machine. But given that this, the sample itself fits in the machine, then there's nothing that you need to do uh, to it. There also are some ways, depending on a particular sample geometry, that the sample can be larger than the field of view, and the data is not sacrificed by doing that, but that's, that's uh, limiting cases. In, in most cases, you do need to get the sample down to the size such that it is completely encompassed within the field of view by the x-ray projection. Okay, so where are we at? Oh, yeah, perfect time. Okay, so now I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna show some images, and I think that I feel much better after Scott's presentation now in terms of not going into the details of each of these materials, just kind of showing what the, what the images look like. So if you wanted to maybe hit the lights a little bit, we'll get some better views here. So this is a, a cross-link polyethylene uh, foam, again. Uh, similar to what you would see in a normal chair arm, but what I can tell you is I can't get into too much details. This is a commercial product. This is a highly engineered version of that for applications in things like filtration and, and all types of things. So this is sample is one by one by two millimeters. You use chromium radiation at 540 nanometer resolution. The scan here took 40 minutes. Now, when I talked about the power of the machine, the difference between being something that's 10 watts you know, or 1,200 watts. The power itself, what does that relate to? Well, of course, it relates to signal to noise, which relates to speed. So for those of you that have done CT work in the past, material science, you probably recall things like 10 hour, right, data collection times. Here, this is an extremely light material, which would be very, very difficult to do on a conventional machine, and we're able to measure it in, in 40 minutes. So this is pretty much the market for, for this machine, for us at Regato, is for people that 
need to do things more than an experimental setup, let's say, in a research lab. For example, what comes to mind here at this university is the idea of an instrument center, right, where you can now do CT as kind of a viable method that, you know, quite frankly, you can get some revenue from because it doesn't take 12 hours to run a sample. But that is one of the, the hot spots of this, this particular machine is that it runs very, very fast. Okay, let's blow that up a little bit. So now we get inside, and here's what makes this to be the, the it's the cross-linking that makes these polyethylene foams one grade or another. And what you can see here is a very, very fine structure here. And these, are, these, these features here are about a micron, right, in this foam. Okay? And again, being able to collect that data on a light material in 40 minutes is something a little unique. Next one, this is, and again, to uh, make the comment, not just to keep referencing Scott, but one of the things that he said I really had to laugh about because I'm exactly the same way, is as soon as I got this CT in the, in the, in the lab, everything looks like a sample to me. Right? I want to put absolutely everything. Right? So, so, so this is a polyester microfiber. This is actually, I got a new pair of glasses a couple weeks ago, and they, you know, they give you those give, give away little cleaning uh, rags. And you can see why this thing works so well. If you look at this, this is like a microscopic mop, right? Really what it looks like. So these are the individual fibers here, but you can see they're also weaving them together, right, in different directions, right? So you actually have this surface that gives you tremendous surface area and cleaning for cleaning. But also because the fibers are so small, the mass is so low, right, that you, that's, what, what, that's why they sell it with glasses or they give away with glasses because it's something that doesn't, doesn't scratch. All right, as, as well. Okay. Okay. Um, this is this is this. What this slide shows is one of the interesting features about the CT measurement. So this is a um, carbon fiber uh, reinforced polymer, and what you're able to do once you get a CT image is you're able to separate the density components. Right, electronically, mathematically, however you want to describe it. So I can simply take the fibers right, out of the matrix. So now I'm just looking at the fibers. I can also look at the pores inside and just remove the pores and look at them by themselves. I can also look at the orientation, for example, of the fibers relative to an axis. Right, of the sample. So the idea is once you co collect the CT and reconstruct the CT, you know everything about that sample. Right? You, can, you can look at it, you can spin it, you can take artificial virtual planes and move through the sample so that you're looking at depth profiling kind of in real time. You can separate out the different densities so you can look at your individual components in the absence you know, of some of the other components that may disturb your image. Right? So this one is actually collected at about 0.27 micrometers per voxel. And again, without getting into the details there, you're saying, oh, what, what does 0.27 mean? You said 0.6. Well, what I'll tell you is that the reconstruction will do 0.27, but the, the, the x-ray beam feeding those pixels is, is redundant. There's oversampling there. Okay. Okay, right? Same thing with the polymer blend, right? What we've got here is we've got one polymer two polymer, and that's the air voids between the three of them. So which once we, we collect the full image, and then we can just expand that out right, to look at the different materials and where they're located. OK, just another example. Uh, again, this is a um, you know, surgical mask. And this is supposed to be a five-layer mask. That's what they, they sell it as. And you can see that we can kind of see one, two, three and then two additional layers. They're alternating high density and low density layers. Now, one of the things, this, this slide I always show, because it is a lot more than just visual. So one, again, once we have this image, once we have this volume, we can, we can do all types of, of numerical analysis on it. So here what we've done is actually just plotted observed uh, a fraction right, as a function of distance. And we're seeing one peak, two peak, three peak, uh, four peaks there seeing the different layers, right? We can look at the individual layers right here as we go. OK. OK, we're, so we're going to show a couple of, I'm gonna, we're running late, so I'm just going to show the two best of the movies. And they're short. So this is an ant lake. This is the one that we collected that one picture from. The beauty of this, as I said, is once we reconstruct this image, we can actually uh, take a look inside and see what's going on.
Oops. Uh oh. We have our first IT. What is that one? That one. Well, we're working on the um, image. Let's open it up for questions. So, uh, questions from here. Let's go to the main or, directory. Uh, I'll run this, it manually. Uh, Right. Well, if everyone's too shy to ask questions in the middle of the talk, I will ask a question that I have been wondering about. Um, Hang on. Let me go. For materials with better. a lot of contrast, like if you have, say, copper on some light polymer, um, does that cause a problem? Or do you have any artifacts because of heavy metal? And you can. So, so that, that particular effect is called beam hardening. So the idea is if you, if you have a heavy metal right, in a, a light element matrix and you were to attempt to use the chromium radiation, you would start to get artifacts from the chromium being absorbed by the metal right, or well, tuned. Because when you think about it, right, every time the X-ray beam hits your sample right, as it's moving along that path, it is now different right, than the previous portion. right. So it's changing constantly. So what will happen is if you have a heavy metal and light, light x-rays, after it gets past that heavy metal, you just change the wavelength completely that's getting through, and then your image will, will change. So let's see if this will work now. OK. Here we go. So this is our ant leg here. This is just we focus from here to here. You can look close, very close. Look at the fibers. Now we're running a plane through it and back. We say, OK, this is hollow. So now let's take a look inside the leg. All right, so you can actually go inside the material there. And that can be any type of sample. People will do that. You know, we do this with the ant leg because it's, it's uh, you know, just kind of interesting. But it's also interesting to do that. Um, with material samples as well. So let me just do one, one more movie here. See if we can get it. This one people like to because everyone's familiar with this. So what this is, this is a pair of genes. And this is the uh, seam right, of the genes that runs, runs down the side. Right, so here's our gene. There's the seam going through. But the beauty of this now, as I said, once we have this calculated, we can look at this in every direction. So now we're going to go in, look into the plane. Now we can rotate it 90 degrees and then do the same depth profile in the other direction. OK, you can put the lights on. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, any, any questions? All right, let's thank our speaker and we'll